It's time for fun, learning, commentary, laughs, and more care of the most diverse group in the genealogy and family history world. Welcome to Black Pro Gen Live with your hosts, Nika and True, and the baddest panel in these pedigree streets, Angela, James, Linda, Alex, Ellen, Tony, Shelly, Teresa, Bernice, Felicia, Willie, Renata, and Tasia. It's Black Pro Gen Live, genealogy, family history research with flavor. Hello and good evening, everybody. We just want to welcome you to another dose of genealogy with seasoning with Black Pro Gen Live. Um, this is our 56th episode. Uh, my name is True Lewis, and I'm going to be your co-host for the evening. And I just want you all to give us a shout out from wherever you're from. And we just want to say welcome you and for taking your time out this Tuesday night. So I'm going to Turn the mic over to your host, Nika Smith, who brings this all for us. All right, everybody. Thank you so much, True, for passing the baton over. How are you? I am fine. <laughs> <laughs> I am fine. <laughs> Well, we want to just say thank you so much, you all, for joining us this evening. We've got a lot of heavy topics to talk about tonight. We don't want to uh, delay the this, this subject matter any further. So just in case you're joining us for the first time, I'm just going to go ahead and talk about what the subject matter is for this evening. There's no denying that the subject matter within the documents we encounter can be emotionally draining. Yet without the information, we will be at a standstill in our research efforts. Tonight, we'll discuss ways to maintain self-care when dealing with tough parts of our history that affected our ancestors. Tonight, join us for Staying in It, Historical Trauma and Self-Care for Genealogists. Before we get in really good tonight, we want to remind you to join the conversation. Be sure to tweet us at Black Pro Gen. Also hashtag any of your tweets, Black Pro Gen. We love to hear from you. There's also a live chat taking place right now. Um, if you are watching on your desktop computer, it's at the top right hand of the screen. And if you're on a mobile app, the YouTube mobile app is at the bottom. Don't forget also to set reminders for future shows. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and click set reminder on the episodes that are of interest to you. I actually went in and loaded episodes all the way until August. So you've got some more stuff to choose from for the episodes that are coming up. Since 2013, the Midwest African American Genealogy Institute has provided an amazing learning experience for genealogists and researchers. The Institute, also known commonly as Maggie, is the only African American focused event offering a total of 48 classes over three days, offering a comprehensive genealogical educational experience of benefit for the beginner, the intermediate researcher, and the professional. Join us from July 10th through 12th, 2018 at the Genealogy Center at the Allen County Public Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana for the fifth installment of Maggie, the Teaching Institute. For more information and to register, please visit maggieinstitute.org. And before we reveal everybody's faces tonight, you're actually going to see some new folks. So I want to go ahead and introduce our first special guest panelist, Dr. Rosalind Newton. Dr. Rosalind Newton is a licensed clinical psychologist. Though initially specializing in forensic psychology, Dr. Newton later found her passion in serving the active duty military and veteran populations. She currently works for the Charlotte VA Medical Center in Compensation and Pension, though much of her five-year tenure with the Veterans Administration has been in serving veterans with combat and military sexual trauma. Prior to working with the Department of Defense and the Veterans Administration, Dr. Newton worked for Central State Hospital, where she also completed a formal postdoctoral training program in forensic psychology. She received undergraduate training at Tougaloo College and completed both her master's and doctorate in psychology at the Illinois School of Professional Psychology. Dr. Newton has earned a diverse treatment experience in, uh, to include working in juvenile and adult correctional facilities, inpatient and long-term care facilities, and has managed her own psychological practice. Our second special guest tonight is Julie 
Julia Joy, the Hill historian, who is a 10th generation Louisianan currently living in exile on the East Coast. She is passionate about prompting, promoting the healing power of reconnecting with our ancestors and understanding how to heal personal, generational, and historical trauma. As a genealogist and trained historian, she believes sharing our ancestors' stories have the power to heal our individual and collective wounds. Connect with her on Twitter at The Hill Historian. All right, everyone. And before we actually get into introducing the panel, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Close your eyes. Breathe in deeply. Even you watching. Breathe out. And breathe in. All right, I just wanted to take a moment to sort of settle ourselves because we're going to be talking about a lot tonight. And panelists, feel free to come off mute. We'll do brief introductions and then we'll, we'll plug right on through because uh, we've got a lot to talk about. All right. First person I'm seeing is Alex signing in from Oakland. We haven't seen you for a while. How are you? I am great. I am ready for this conversation and I'm glad to be back on the panel. Awesome. Next up, Bernice Bennett. Well, hello, everyone. And Bernice from the Ireland and Blog Talk Radio. All right, Ellen. Hey, Ellen Fernandez Sacco, Latino Genealogy and Beyond.com. Um, everything's good here in Tampa. All right, next up, James. You're on mute, James. I'm sorry about that, I was too busy meditating. Uh, <laughs> good evening, everybody. James Morgan coming to you from nation's capital, Washington, DC, and I'm always happy to be on Black Poja. All right, all right, Shelly Murphy. Shelly Murphy in Virginia, AKA Family Tree Girl, and all is calm in Central Virginia, especially Charlottesville. All right, Teresa. Teresa Vega, Uptown, New York City, uh, Radiant Roots, Barrico Branches, and I am happy to be here. True. Hello, everybody. It's your girl, True Lewis of My True Roots, and I'm here at Fort Knox, Kentucky. All right. And our two beautiful, gorgeous guests with glasses tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, you can wave and say hello. Hello, everyone. I'm really honored to be here. I, I have been um, just admiring from afar a lot of the work um, from plenty of you guys and Twitter stalking half of you. So it's, <laughs> it's really nice to see your faces and hear your voices. Good, good. I love her TWA. There's a lot of natural hair tonight. I'm feeling that. All right. And, and my boo, all the way from North Kakalak. Hey, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you, Nika, uh, my cousin, for inviting me. Absolutely. I've, I've known her more than half my life when we were both going through adolescence and listening to Silk Records. If you don't know who Silk is, then, you know, you just don't know. Yeah. <laughs> That's when you know you're grown. You know what? <laughs> I'm tired of you. <laughs> Over here trying to be serious, and here you come. We want to go ahead and shout out the chat room. We've got somebody from Decatur, Mississippi in here tonight. Boy, I mean, I don't even know where that is. We're gonna have to look for look, we're gonna have to look for that on the map. ATL is in the house, Houston, NYC. I'm getting a strange feedback. Um, let me go ahead and just I'm just gonna mute. I'm gonna mute who I think it is. Um, let's see who else we've got. Uh, gosh, Miami, Florida's in the house. Memphis, hey, nine on one in the room. DMV, Milwaukee. Oh my gosh, there's somebody from Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Roz is from Milwaukee. That's awesome. And our curly, our curly girl that just met Shelly, she is in the chat room as well. Orlando, Florida. Wow, we've got a lot of folks here tonight. And uh, you and know what? Rightfully so. Go ahead. Uh, and and Nika, I got to give a shout out to my lion cousin, Christine. She's in the chat room and uh, I'm happy to, that she's here. Awesome. Awesome. We've also got Kansas, Oklahoma, Baltimore mm -hmm. is here. Goodness. And I think, yes, Julia is the first person to rep Delaware. We have never had a Delawarean um, on the show. <laughs> so, <laughs> James will try to claim it, though. <laughs> uh, no, so a lot of people will not claim Delaware. So mm -hmm. you go ahead and you rock that. You rock it with all your splendor this evening. I got uh, it. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you all. So 
this is a topic that is super timely considering what in the world is going on today, right? I mean, gosh, our world is so connected and because we're so connected, because we have so much access to information, we're overloaded with it. And in some ways I feel like we haven't learned how to appropriately process the information that we're getting. Um, it's weird, when I was in college, I had this professor that was described the internet and, and it was hilarious when I was in class, but the way that she talked about it was like, you just got all this stuff flying at you in your face. And at first I was like, that is so strange. But now that I think back on it, it's really true. We are getting information at rapid fire pace, you know, where it used to take us, you know, I mean, think about this, think about having encyclopedias in your home, right? You want to know something, you'd go to the encyclopedia, you'd look it up and that was it. Or maybe you'd have to ask someone who was knowledgeable, but now we have so much available at our fingertips, it's almost overwhelming. And for the things that are overwhelming, we may not be taking the time to fully emotionally and mentally process those things. And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, especially, in the work that we do, we're dealing with history, we're dealing with things we can't change, we're dealing with things that are are happy, things that are sad, you know, it's a vast array of emotions. We thought that this was an appropriate topic for us to have this year because, you know, we, we should be talking about self-care. Um, just in general, let's not even talk about what's going on in the world and people getting, you know, the police called on them, checking out of an Airbnb. We aren't right. even at that place yet. We're just talking about, you know, what you deal with and you encounter when you start to really dig deeply into your family history and your genealogy research. So with that set up, I just wanna start out with the first question. You know, why do you think it becomes easy for family history researchers to cast aside the emotional nature of the work we do? I don't. I, I, don't, that's, I don't think it's easy at all. I don't either. <laughs> I don't. There's no separation. There is absolutely no, no separation. There is no disconnect past to present. It's mm -hmm. just one continuum to me. Yeah, I'm yeah, there with I you. Agree with you. I agree with you. You know, every time I, I talk about connecting with the slave owner descendant of my family, it, it still takes me into a place where I have to remember my very first reaction when I saw my ancestors on an inventory uh, with a number next to them, a price tag. I was, I was just devastated. I mean, I didn't say it out loud, but I, as I drove back to the airport, the only thing I could think of is they had no rights. Somebody owned them. They were property. Mm-hmm. And that's very difficult. And, you know, even sometimes when I listen to genealogists and they're presenting uh, uh, information about a probate record and they, they just say it's so easy. It's just like, oh, mm -hmm. the chair, the door, <laughs> you know, but it's still a human being that you're talking about. And I just can't separate. I can't say he's a piece of paper. No, it's, it's, it was my ancestor. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my ancestor. Mm -hmm. You know, what's funny is that to me is that you, I listened to you all's reactions and I actually felt a little, feel a little differently. And I think part of it may be a generational thing in terms of how we um, are first exposed to certain elements of, of, of our family's history and whatnot. Um, you know, I, I remember when I first started getting into my family history, you know, slavery, it, it, and, and the pictures of the past are something that I've always kind of grown up having at my fingertips, whether it was VHS or DVD or now the, you know, the World Wide Web or what have you. Mm -hmm. And so some things, I mean, we're exposed to violence all the time in the generation. I mean, I'm, I'm in my late 20s. And so, I mean, I play violent video games all the time and all the type of stuff. And so those type of things didn't really um, bother me as much. And, I, and, I, and I'll be honest with you, I was very cognizant of that and felt that maybe they should have bothered me more. And I had one experience that, that I'll never forget where I was looking at a probate record and it mentioned my fourth great grandfather being leased for a season to another slave owner. And I was noting it in my on my laptop and I was being a very like detached scholar. And then I paused and said, wait a second. And I, I verbally said this to myself out loud. I said, that's my grandfather. And I realized that I had, there was something in me that hadn't made that connection yet. I think, and I just think it's part of it is the, the generation I grew up in, even it's, 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 there's more of a distance there, I think. And that's not necessarily a good thing, but it's just, it's an observation. I, I, I'm going to add to that because um, 
regarding the generation, I'm a little bit old school. I was raised by my grandparents. And um, I, I said this before in a different episode. I, I, you know, when our folks left Massachusetts, the first thing, two things they did when they came back, which was stop at the family cemetery and go have some seafood. And that has always been there. They're, they're, we were raised by our elders. Um, we grew up with them. And, and there's it's just one continuous line that there's no disconnection there. Um, they're still with us. And it, it just depends on how you were raised. And in many respects, I, I still have their voices with me wherever I go. Um, and and I can't look. I, I remember finding, seeing the bill of sale of my fourth great uncle, age of three, you know, um, and, and what that did to me, taking the train back to the city. There's more to that story, but a three-year-old. Yeah. yeah. Alex. Um, Alex, I want to hear from you as somebody on the on the younger end of the spectrum. Definitely, one of my earliest experiences. I grew up part in Alabama and Sacramento, California. So every year we'd go back to Alabama, and I was very aware of the racial um, differences that would go on as we crossed these straight these state uh, boundaries. And anyway, until I was about twelve, thirteen, when I started to research, it didn't really dawn on me how real. Um, even outside of slavery, because it would take me, you know, it would take me until I was about 16, 17, until I got to actual slave records in my family history. But, you know, even in just the stories of my grandmother's memory, her growing up, my mother being born in a house in Alabama, realizing those traumas and the way that they had impacted us, even here in California, even in our little Californian bubble um, or millennial California bubble. We definitely didn't have to experience some of those things. So now that I've become kind of a seasoned researcher and I've worked with tons of different experiences with people and their family trees, I realized this last year, I said, okay, this is obviously the reason why I'm losing sleep. This is obviously the reason why, you know, I'm very um, empathetic to a lot of things because we're reading it constantly. You know, a rape here, a lynching here, uh, you know, even a foreclosure on someone's family home, those things are passed on to us and they stick with us. They shape our family. So one of the things that has been a constant struggle for me, um, it's, it, I'm training to be a historian now um, and constantly dealing with these, these you know, in, in history, we don't really focus much on the joyful things all the time. It's always the life upsets and upheavals on a massive scale. So, you know, constantly I'm having to deal with where I'm going to, how long I'm going to stay in it, right? This a keeping with the topic. How long am I going to actually put myself in this historic setting uh, and what that impact is going to do on me? I always have to consider that before I kind of move along because it can definitely be real and have real effects. Uh, something I want to chime in with, though, too, is, you know, because I think this is a really good conversation. A lot of times when we're gathering facts, right, like when you this is the difference between, I think, being a name collector and being a genealogist. Right. Or being a, a tried and true family historian, a name collector, somebody who is just going after those facts. You know, they're drilling down into them just so they can get to the next record or verify the next thing. A real tried and true family historian or genealogist is is doing more than just collecting names and just collecting facts. They're really synthesizing the information that they're getting. And in some ways you have to synthesize that based on financial means, like what, you know, for this particular calculation of money exchanged or money that's mentioned, what's the actual dollar value today so that it's relatable to the folks that you share the information with, you know, or it's something emotional in nature, as we talked about just now, seeing your ancestor, you know, listed on an inventory or a will or, you know, leased out to somebody else and, and putting yourself in their circumstance and, and really, really in some ways calling back on those chromosomes and those segments to remind you mentally how excruciating it was for you emotionally, mentally, physically to experience that. Because see, your body and your mind and your spirit has not forgot those things. It's just that they become reawake, reawakened when you rediscover the information and then it becomes it can, it's a continual reawakening when you pass the information on to your family members. So I don't know if anybody else sees it that way. That's the way I see it. Um, and, and so maybe it is a little bit of both. Maybe it is a little bit of 
I didn't factor it in that way because of the nature of how things have changed. And maybe it is a little of, yes, I, I remember and I recognize it immediately. I think it's sort of a, a, a sort of an in-between. Um, and, I, and I don't think age, you know, I, age may not may not be a determinant of that. What do you all think? I think, I think the memory um, is key. Go what ahead. Were gonna, what were you going to say, Julia? I, I think that our culture trains us to distance ourselves from these stories so that we don't fully heal and we don't have these conversations. Um, I'm not the therapist, but my mom's a therapist too. So, and then I, ha I have the history. So I think that's kind of why I got into historical trauma. Um, we have cognizant dissonance, you know, we, we know, okay, slavery happened, but we can think of it as a far away idea. But once we have proof that this is my family, um, like, for instance, my family is from the German coast, Louisiana, um, right? About Mine, miles too. North. There you go. My nieces, um, too. Mine, too. Alice, <laughs> We're probably cousins because <laughs> it's All like eight fun. families. But um, basically, um, my grandmother's house and my father, oh, my, my paternal grandmother's house, we, I grew up um, in, plant, in plantation country. We knew there were plantations. The, my grandmother's house lives is right across from the Whitney Plantation, which has now been turned into the slave museum. Mm -hmm. And it never dawned on me, you know, um, like I knew we had been there for a long time, but then to find my great grandfather getting this land and then ha finding my ancestors' names, it's just, it's shocking, it's disturbing. And then we have to reconcile with that. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with Dr. Joy DeGruy, her work, mm -hmm. um, and just a lot of the current work of epigenetics and how trauma is lodged in our DNA and in our body. Um, this is serious healing work that we're doing. I really think that true historians, uh, family history, um, genealogists, we're doing spiritual work. Um, and in order to reconnect with our ancestors, I think it's really important. And I, uh, go ahead. Thank you. I, I, I thank you. Um, one of the things where, especially since late October, um, in dealing with the cemetery lawsuit, uh, the past month has been a lot because I don't see anything. It's it's just a continuum. Um, here in you know the 1800s, my ancestors were last name Negro. OK, and then they have a name. Um, but back then, they didn't have a choice to define themselves. They, they were defined by others. And here I am the past month dealing with a battle, a battle of, of just getting justice for my ancestors, for the right to be called what we've always have been and get in the static and then get into the point where when I tell you my blood pressure was stroke level, it was because this is real. This isn't, this isn't made up, but when you have uh, a person who, she, she's a good person and I give her credit, but totally unaware of how she herself um, still holds the power. She has the power to determine what my ancestors are named. Okay, did it matter that I kept telling her we, that wasn't what we were? We know who we are. And I, it got to the point where I basically threatened that if this isn't done, if you don't acknowledge my native and African roots and the fact that we were black and native, native and black, and we were erased under the mulatto, Negro colored, et cetera, category, then guess what? No one is gonna have access to the research my cousin Andrea and I've done for over a decade, nonstop, so, no one. So so it got to the point where that's what it took for us to be named what we always have been. But that process is one where the person was totally unaware of how they were being perceived by me. I'm, I'm, people are telling me, Teresa, you gotta understand this person's um, perspective without considering how I felt. And I always find that to be, you know, uh, 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 irritating. I don't know how, how other, you know, my feelings, 
the feelings of my ancestors are just pushed aside and I'm made to, you know, uh, once again, you know, be told to have sympathy with this person, but this person really doesn't understand what, you know, where I'm coming from. That so, is an Ra issue I have. Ra, so I, I want to ask you about this on like a biological level. Like what does cognitive, cognitive dissonance, like what is that, what, what does it do to your body? Like what, you know what I mean? Like when you're forced into that position mm -hmm. as a, as a part, like what, but explain this to us on a biological level, because I think people don't realize that, th that this hap stuff biologically happens to you when things like this take place. So in, in terms of, I want to speak to um, what, I, I can't remember her name, the lady who was just last speaking, Teresa. Teresa, yeah, Teresa. Teresa. So something, and something that actually happens is that, you know, when other people are, who are so disconnected, they're disconnected because it isn't necessarily their experience. Um, that, so slavery really affected, you know, both sides of, of, the, of the argument in that with Caucasians, whites, they, there, is, there was cognitive dis dissonance in that they had to justify the, the way they were treating people, right, to make it okay. Uh, and so that way of thinking was carried out throughout, even after slavery ended, you had sharecropping and then you had the lynching and then you had Jim Crow. And then, so you have, you know, generations after generations after generations of showing, uh, modeling this behavior to children. And in their mind, African-Americans, they're not human. They're not human, they don't have value. And so when they see this repeatedly, it actually changes the chemistry in our brains. And so, um, the the way that we move past is that everyone has to get come to the table and just acknowledge like you know the magnitude of all of this and when it comes to um I wasn't actually familiar with Dr. Joy DeGray until recently you know in treating trauma I am primarily treating direct trauma right and so as genealogists what you're constantly inundated with is secondary traumatization and when you're repeatedly exposed to these things, it also does something to your brain chemistry. And what we start to see, uh, especially when it comes really close to your history, your people, right? You, your brain, if you've expo been exposed so much to, to records, you can almost formulate certain things in your mind, right? You go back to these places and, and just the, the connotation that uh, plantation holds, right? That, that's so much power in that word. I won't live in a neighborhood uh, if, if this is the title of this neighbor. I don't. I don't want to be connected to that because for me, I know what that what that means, right? So um, it has. It can have a, a lasting impact, which is why when things like this come up, you feel that reactivity and that's hyper arousal. Um, and so there are times where, where like for example, if I'm working with a trauma patient and there's something that comes really close to their trauma, it doesn't matter what I'm saying. If I touch those toes too much. There's arousal that comes up and it's, it's, it's a biological, physical, physiological process where your central nervous system is saying, get ready, get ready, stay on alert. This, there, this is dangerous. So you this are... is, so this is something, I mean, and sorry to interrupt you, but I feel like yeah. this is really like when we see, like I brought the Airbnb incident where these yeah. women were, you know, checking out of this Airbnb, here come the police, here's a helicopter. You know, we see this incident, we see Starbucks, we see the Native American young men who had the police called on them as a part of being a part of the college tour. Exactly. When you, that's secondary trauma. I didn't even, it didn't even dawn on me until you just said that, right? Yeah. Because it literally re, it re, we were all rewired. It, it, what it does, it reinforces, it reinforces um, what we, what we try to, um, well, society tries to separate us from it, right? It's over now. Um, the playing field is even now, but is it really? At what point? did healing occur and if you think about you know generally generationally speaking um because you know my parents come from the era of segregation my mom primarily born in, in wisconsin and raised in milwaukee but my dad lived in mississippi for a, a good piece of his upbringing and so the way that and then my dad was in vietnam and came back and the way he was treated from there so the way that they even reared me and the way that you need to carry yourself, the way. So um, experiences that they have start to, you know, help form my behavior and my perspectives um, on 
you know, you have to be mindful of how you carry yourself because people are going to see you a particular way. And then when things like this happen in the future, they kind of reinforce um, these, you know, alarms, if you will, to let my, me know, hey, you need to be mindful um, because it can be it can be dangerous. You can have very good intentions. Um, and, and to some degree, I think if you have so I have to sometimes even as a professional being placed where I'm the only black person and something comes up. I, in my mind, I'm, I, I say to myself, is this racially driven? I, I don't want to be the, and I feel so much pressure uh, to, to not always fall on that excuse. Um, although there is something internally within our, within our guts that tell us, hey, there's an alarm that goes off um, because mm. of the way our people have been treated. And until there's reckoning with that, not just on our side, but on 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 everybody's if this is a collective yeah. matter and until um, yeah. that happens heal you know healing will be stifled james you had a uh, you had a question yeah um and actually uh D dr Rosalyn, you just you, you inspired me reminded me about an experience i had um this past fall i was in nigeria uh, which is one of my ancestral homelands apparently um and uh we were on a highway driving and a, i saw a police car pulled at, you know a driver over and I told the group I was with, I said, you know, that's interesting. And everybody said, what? I said, that's the first time I've ever seen a police car pull a black person over. And I haven't been looking at it like a life and death situation because I was in Nigeria, you know? So it's, it's kind of interesting how we have those um, defense mechanisms that we've grown over time um, and we've developed. Um, I wanted to make sure I mentioned, this is actually a book by one of my relatives, actually, um, Dr. Naeem Akbar, uh, Breaking the Change of Psychological Slavery. And I highly suggest folks get pick this up. Um, in there, um, my co cousin Naeem talks about um, the power of images and how they um, help develop our self-esteem or can help destroy it. Um, and we and we know about the different stereotypes that people have put on us in various forms of media. But one of the events that happened recently that I think we all basically participated in, in some way, shape, or form, was the release of Black Panther. And I thought that that was very interesting that was a very interesting moment for me because like everybody and their mama, I think even on, on, on here, we had a couple people dress up in African attire and stuff like that. Um, what, what, as, a, as, a, uh, um, as, as a, a doctor in the field and a scholar in the field, what do you think the um, value is, if any, of moments like that? Because it seems like for whatever reason, blacks in America, we're, we're so attached to the television and movies and whatnot. So when a film like that comes out, and people who you've, who I had never seen wearing any type of African attire, all of a sudden now, Wakanda forever. <laughs> you know, you, you know, um, what is that? Is that healing? Is that a healing process? Is that what? What? What would you, from a psychological standpoint, how would you view a moment like that? Because I, I think we've seen it before, and I just think it's interesting that I don't see other people doing that type of stuff in the same way. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it can be. Um, healing, I think, is just a part of it, it's a part of that continuum of feeling. Like I, I think the movie um, was actually just a part of this journey we've been on. There's been like this movement of empowering Black women, and like there's so much going on right now. And I, I think um, it can be healing for any um, sub subculture where you don't see a lot of representation and you don't see a lot of diverse representation. So if you think about um, Black Panther, there were different hues, different shades. Like even in everyone in the movie, you have people who were in the movie as actors who are all from all over the world, right? Um, and so there's there's something to be said, you know, in American culture, um, there are various ideals that are sent to us through our senses as to what beauty is, as to what um, success mm -hmm. looks like, you know? And for many times as a child, as being a dark skinned girl, I, I didn't see very many images that looked like me. You know, um, and so for especially I think for children, um, it helps them to feel you know good about themselves, embrace uh, that beauty. But we can't stop there just with the images that are seen on you know in in mainstream media because the power is kind of diminished if it isn't reinforced in the environment. You know, through um, the messages that they're receiving at home, at school, at, you know, any other um, place where they are. So I think it can absolutely. Um, contribute to healthy esteem development, things like that. Um, but it can't stop there. Um, I, yeah, I was going to say, um, God, we, we ain't even hit the next question. <laughs> 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 we, 
we we like dug deep. I have a lot. I um, also say too, when you have movies like Black Panther, and then it's followed by all these other things, I think it just it, it can affect people differently, you know, because um, you you feel so much pride and enthusiasm, and it's like wow, this feels. And and if you go, they they actually I watched so many different videos on how they publicize it in other cultures, and they were just equally excited, you know. Um, but then you see other things that that come come out in the news because we are inundated with information, and it's almost like as soon as you there's a rise in hope, you know, there's a sting, um, and it just becomes extremely disheartening, um, extremely disheartening, and you know, so it can affect people differently um, depending on their realities, their day to day realities. So we we've we've. Thank you for that, Ross, because I think that I think that was a great question, James, because I feel still like we're all like up here and there's been like a lot of chipping, like attempted chipping away and it hasn't quite done that yet. Um, I think the different events that have taken place, i.e. the situation last week with Mr. West and whatnot, that sort of has fortified us more. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like at this point in time, we needed Black Panther because of what else is going on in the world. We needed that that uh, that undergirding, so to speak. So we've, we've talked some about the traumatic events. Um, let's talk a little bit about what are some of the most traumatic things that you all have encountered in your research? And um, along with that question, um, were these events shared through oral history or did you discover or unearth them? We'll just talk about this briefly. Um, I want to say that the first information that I encountered in my history, no one told me this, was to find a newspaper clipping in 1907 that my great great grandfather was murdered by a quote, law abiding citizen. That was devastating because it just is it was almost like we needed a black lives matter movement back then and that was very difficult to just read it and then i ordered the coroner's report and i read the testimonies of the various people and it was very difficult to just read and and understand that that's a part of my family history that was never talked about Anyone, um... I, I, Shelly, go. I'll go after Shelly. Yeah, I, for me, I can't get past the ownership. I guess I get halted at that spot. Yes, legal, whatever, but I can't get past that. And sometimes, uh, you know, for myself, I have to calm myself down because, again, I don't give out passes on that. There, you know, I just think even before we get through the lives of the enslaved family members, even the trauma that the free people of color experienced, they might not have been owned, but they still had the treatment of somewhat of what the slaves did on the plantation because there's still things they weren't able to do. But I just can't get past that the backing of the religion supported all of this if that was a you know a true or whatever um, religion and so i find myself getting so negative towards the religion that kept allowing this to happen up till today because it's still happening in different forms it's just dressed up a little bit differently and so again, I got, I've said it earlier, that book um, by Miss Barry, it still sits on my shelf. And I've heard her interview three different times, met her in person, and that's the, the Pound of Flesh book. And that's traumatizing when she's talking about babies and breeding and, and coins. And another incident is uh, True had found an inventory sheet and the value of the lady on the sheet was $500.50. The $500 didn't bother me, but that darn 50 cent tore me up. I, you know, again, back on the ownership and the value. Mm -hmm. So I'm a meditator. So that's one way 
you know, I can sit still and, and kind of go out away. But we have to recognize this as family historians, as researchers, genealogists and whatever, that this is happening all the time and you don't know it's nipping at the bud at you because of high blood pressure and et cetera and et cetera, that we have to have the mechanisms in place to be able to deal with this. Because just like you said, we're reading and researching trauma daily. It's not once a month. We do this daily, hours on hours on hours. So to, true. <laughs> I, I was, I was going to uh, say, uh, Alex uh, also wanted to chime in uh, after you, Teresa. Okay. Uh, uh, the absolute worst story I've come with, and it was a true story. And I, I tend to use my blog to talk about the truth, whether it's mm -hmm. the good, bad, utterly ugly. I've written two blog posts simply because um, when I first found my second great grandfather after uh, on my Puerto Rican side after a, a decade search of not knowing his maternal surname. I had a DNA cousin, Maddie, and, and she lives up here and not too far from me. And I was so happy to have that connection and know his maternal surname. And within the first hour of talking to her, she's like, do you know he's, he was assassinated? And I didn't know. Mm. And, and you want to talk about historic trauma? My second great grandfather, if you saw a picture, you could tell he was of Taino descent. That was a reason why. They, he, was, he was jailed for being one of the first members of the Puerto Rican Autonomous Party for three years. He comes out and he, he, was, he, he considered himself a real man. He wrote to the Guardia Civil, Civil Guard, asking to, to, you know, why don't you be a man now that I'm free? He was expecting to be met with this guy who was met by five. They beat him up. If that wasn't enough, they lynched him from a Guasima tree. If that wasn't enough, they gutted him. Mm. Penis in his mouth, testicles in his pocket. If that wasn't enough, they then cut him down. And in the space between the church, behind the church, there was a cemetery. In that space, they laid his body out on the stairs and set him on fire. Okay? Mm. If that isn't traumatic... Before I wrote my two mm -hmm. blog posts, the only references to him was in a, uh, 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 just an urban legend that if you went behind the church and you heard voices, it was the trees because they were crying out. They were the only witnesses. And mm -hmm. then there was a book in Spanish that was written, come to find out, it was written by the son of his best friend. And the title in English is called Political Assassination. Okay, I read that book. And the first thing I did when I went to Puerto Rico was, you know what, we're filming, we, we filmed an Ancestry DNA commercial, but before we left, I had to do a ceremony and incorporated my, my, my cousins there on that line. And, and we had to remember him and we used that book, whether we like it or not, that book is the closest thing we have to truth. As horrific as it is, it's the the only thing that we have that is the closest account to truth. And it, it's an ugly truth. And I want the world to know it because it happened. And it happened in 1890. And like I said, it's still happening. You know, so I have to speak up, you know, and use my voice, if anything, to articulate what my ancestors went through and what we're still going through. Mm -hmm. And Alex. that is real. Alex, <clears throat> my my response. I, I just feel like I have to directly respond to Teresa from her first comment on the on the first question, um, you know, about the woman who had power over even what your ancestors would be called in this day and age. And I feel like if you were to ask me what the most traumatic experience of mine is in my research, it is white people telling our ancestor stories and laying that out as law. Um, I come from my people tease me because I come from like really large families who um, love to be written about nowadays. So I come from the Cane River Creoles. I descend from Ritres Coin Coin. Um, oh, and then okay. I also come from, from Jordan Banks and Noble and I descend from Muscogee Creeks in Alabama and so on and so forth. I'm a Gulf Coast Creole and there's plenty of stories to be told. 
just like all of our families. However, there are particular white people in this day and age who have taken a fetishization almost of our ancestors' stories and making them the authority. Um, and they are the ones who are out here certifying people as genealogists, and the truth. Um, they are the ones who are out here um, making the documentaries, publishing the books, and then also withholding information from descendants and from the community. So if there's a traumatic um, experience for me, it is myself and my ancestors being left out of a conversation about us. Um, and in this day and age, I feel like having the power to make sure that that is not happening lies in us on this panel and, and those that we're impacting because we're the ones out here doing this this emotional labor to these, and I hate to, I hate to sound like this, but to these white folks, literally these are names and dates. And as we said before, you know, these are our ancestors. We would not be here. So I get pretty impassioned about it um, because I've just noticed this over, over the years. You know, here's a book published here. Here's a book published here. Um, in 2015, and I'll, I'll leave with this because you guys know I'm long-winded, but um, in 2015 was the bicentennial of the Battle of New Orleans. One of my ancestors, Jordan Noble, was a huge um, figure in that. That was the first time in 200 years that a Black person who literally won this war for the country was acknowledged, okay? It was 2015 in, in New Orleans, a city that just, um, how, how long? Five, ten years prior had been underwater, right? Mm -hmm. First time they acknowledged, they flew me out. Um, the Louisiana State Museum had me be one of their chief contributors to tell his story. I was only like 18, 19 at that time. But regardless, they flew me out. I was called boy. I was told, why is this important? By archivists and, and scholars. And yet my name was left out from some of the final concrete things. And so was my family who carry PhDs and so on and so forth who have all been writing about this. So when I think about that, it's in this day and age, and it's also in the past. And it's up to us to make sure that this does not continue, because they will. Michael Twitty, um, in his in his book, the, Quick, the Cooking Gene, has, in the first chapter, he talks about how you go to these plantation tours, and these docents are telling you, oh, well, this walk, yes, Teresa. Um, they'll say, oh, well, this walk was, you know, something some subtly racist thing about slaves singing and stuff going to the kitchen when real when in reality it was to keep bird droppings and other things out of the food but in the meantime nobody will ever question them no one will ever question the 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 actual accuracy of these docents of these white scholars of these white teachers of these white reporters um but when it comes to us, we have to have that burden of proof. We have to literally undress ourselves and our ancestors in order for our stories to be told. So uh, you bring up important points, though, Alex, because this, this is the next set of questions I have for everybody is, yes, you're finding out the information about these events. Yes, you're processing it. Yes, you're adding it to whatever system you have. But how are you documenting this? So that there is not another opportunity for somebody to write you out. How are you communicating this information to your family members or to the people that you're researching on behalf of? Because it's all good in theory for us to sit here and to have a conversation about this and to recount these stories. But if the work is not being done within our individual families, in our individual circles, to dispense this information to them, which can then inform and potentially change lives, what, what good is it doing? You know, for, for, for example, right? We just went on, we had an amazing time at a cruise last July. We had so much fun. Rosalind was there with me. We were having a, a great time on that cruise. But there was no way that I could have those 50 people together. And I didn't bring that piece of paper that I had just found months prior that had our shared ancestors name, the dollar value, who the slave owner was, there was no way that I could squander that opportunity considering that these people came from near and far to gather together under the pretense of family. So I, I'm saying that because I really feel like we need to hammer this home. It may not be that you need to start a blog. It may not be that you need to start a podcast. At the very least, transfer the information verbally to your other family members. Mm -hmm. 
to the people who it affects, to the people who have an emotional tie to those folks that you're reading about, that you that you've you, that you subjected yourself to secondary trauma for. What is what is the purpose of continually subjecting yourself to secondary trauma if all you're going to do is keep it bottled up and you're not going to do anything with it? Nika, you know, you're preaching to the choir here. Excellent point. And, and I want to add to that. Um, one of the things, because I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm old school. My grandparents said, if we're going to be good, we got to be twice as good. Um, I plan to write that book because I know some of us will be challenged from Jump Street in ways that other people are never challenged. Okay. I've seen books come out like some of you know where a quarter page was 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 documenting a slave history in Greenwich, okay? I've seen other books that have a lot less research than what I have now. I could have written a book easily with what I have, but that ain't Teresa A. Vega. You all should know that, right? Megatron's gonna be full effect because I know it has to be a book that has to be citable, that all the receipts have to be way more than necessary because that is how I'm gonna succeed. People aren't gonna approach my book and say, oh no, it's true, here I have all the documentation. And it's those voices and I plan, and, I, and one of the best things, I'll tell you what, uh, one of the best things this couple could have done is reunite all phases, all parts of our white and black side. They didn't know that when I stepped on that cemetery ground for the first time, I know my ancestors above the rock formation and below were, were letting me know something ain't right. You need to do something. You need to reunite this family. And we've done that. And together we're finding out a history that no one knew before. So when I write this book, it's already groundbreaking. Let's, un let's say it for what it is, but Julia. it's going to be citable. Mm -hmm. Julia, um, Julia, you're next, then James, and then after James, Bernice. Okay, um, well, to answer the question about sharing the information, there's one rule that I kind of go off of as my experience in the archives. If it's less than 100 years old, um, like for my family, I keep it private, but I let people know verbally if it's 100 years old or over, I publish it. I put it on my blog, I'll put it on. Um, ancestry. I have gone through and linked enslaved people to their slaveholders so that those people who are researching, um, they will know automatically that their ancestors own slave. I know that um, I reached out like to ancestry and other places. You know, I, I can, I'll add in, in my database that I link them, it links them as children and then I will change it. Um, but some people will st have stopped and said, hey, I didn't realize my ancestors owned slave. I didn't realize. They think farmer that they were literally farming, you know, but they don't write about the 140 people that was actually doing the work. Um, and that's that's what disturbs me is that push from, you know, in Louisiana, we have these wonderful plantations and people will literally get married in them. And I'm I'm like, are you? They they're quick to pull down the slave cabins, but let's glory this wonderful architecture. And I'm like, well, who built this architecture? Come on, <laughs> preach. This preach. man who did cleaned not do that. who cleaned who cleaned that marble head uh, that marble uh, uh, fireplace. That's yes. the one thing. Sorry to interrupt you, but that is when I talk about pet peeves. This is and, and and to go back to your point about uh about the homes and and all that other kind of stuff and 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 just do a cursory search if you have a slaveholder that you've been researching and this is an experiment for everybody because I know I know you're going to prove my point because I've done this just just when you're searching for for a slaveholder and you know you have the basic information go online and look at the trees of the descendants who are researching that person. And I want you to just literally just get a notepad. It don't have to be anything special. Get a little notepad, okay? Write down a tally of the number of people actually noted that the person was a slaveholder. Just oh, put that number, yeah. okay? Just put that number and then count the number of trees that that person is mentioned in. And look at that ratio. And if the ratio is not coming well, is not showing up well in, in the wash, 
that means that you have work to do. Because a lot of those folks are either unaware or they're ignorant on purpose because they've come across the information or it is your job, it is your purpose to unearth that information and to share that information. Um, and and I, I just I just really have to say that because, you know, there are people in the chat room who are slaveholders, descendants, and these are folks that I know are documenting these things. But I, I really want everyone watching to go through that exercise because it, it is will really reinforce for you how ingrained this is within our culture and how much we are not talking about it, and how much we are not processing. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I, I have one more thing. Go um, ahead. Go ahead, Julia. And also, you know, being a descendant of slaves, I'm also a descendant of slave holders as well. When I reach out to people, um, they're so quick to be like, no, 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 we're not related. <laughs> 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 I'm like, it's, it's, it's okay. We yeah. are. I have proof. And the one trauma that I, that was passed on to me from my grandmother is that we knew that there was a lot of rape in the family. Um, and me going through finding a, a, one of my ancestors who was 20 years old being sold with a seven-year-old son, you know, do the math. Um, another one of my ancestors was had several children with an overseer. So me finding these things, and what's funny is that the families themselves will never admit to it. I have the proof. They knew who their people was. It's on a death certificate. You know, we have DNA matches, but it's no, 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 you're, you're wrong, or I don't wanna hear that. So if we can't even acknowledge what happened and we have DNA proof, we have a, a long, long way to go. Exactly. Exactly. Um, let's see. I think James is next. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, hey, I think you you all are hit, hitting it on hitting it on the head. Um, I think that the, one of the other things that's key about this topic for it has been for me because I I come from a family of a lot of older people, you know. So um, it has been not just that distant deep history, but even more recent stuff. I mean, in, in some of the conversations I've had with my grandparents and, and my great grandfather just turned 99 last Sunday. So shout out to granddaddy Wally down in Alabama. Um, but being able to have those conversations with them about, you know, their lived experiences and, and things that, you know, that they saw. I mean, you know, asking my great grandfather about, you know, his grandparents that he knew and, and all of them whom had been uh, had been born in slavery um, and just seeing the look on his eyes. You know what I mean? Um, and being able to, video, and thankfully with the wonders of technology, being able to videotape that and, and other things of that nature, um, I think it's important that we do share it. Again, as, as um, Julia mentioned, sharing things responsibly, but but sharing it, and even sharing our own um, uh, trepidations or issues. You know, when you find out that, oh my, my God, my great grandmother was raped or something, you know, tragic occurred, even if it was not necessarily a racial thing, it may have been something in house, you know, whether it was with a, uh, uh, you know, how many families have um, pedoph pedophiles and all type of things that go on in families that we don't talk about, but need to be shared. And you never know, you may be doing this deep history work, but you may end up helping somebody else that you know, you didn't even know this person went through that when they were a child, but now they may explain why your auntie is really mean or why uncle this one doesn't really talk to this one. Or you, you never really know until you start digging up um, the family history, how stuff has trickled down through the generations, so to speak. I mean, I'm thinking about that movie. If anybody saw the movie um, Red Hook Summer, the Spike Lee uh, movie, and you go through this whole thing with the minister, his grandfather, and you find out, you know, the historical trauma in the family. That was just a small uh, example, but but yeah, I think this is this is very important that we uh, that, that we continue to share and that we allow someone else maybe to even share with us because they may need to lean on us at a certain time. Ellen, oh, I don't I don't know where to start. Like. <laughs> There's so many great um, insights here. Um, I think about people's lack of accountability, I mean, in terms of a, of a broader structure. And I think that's part of the slippage that happens when people just go like, I don't have to think about that. I don't know. Even though they could be related to you, they can just turn their backs and walk away from it. Um, with my family, my third great grandfather boasted about being a slave owner, which is very weird because he was only like 12 at the time when abolition came. So like, what's that about? And then, uh, so I had to work with a lot of oral history to unpack what was going on, which is actually his father's business. And then I also descend from, from probably a free or enslaved person as well, but I haven't found enough information on that. But through my grandmother, my, my grandparents don't, 
they don't really exist in a way. I mean, I have no pictures of them. Um, and this is, this is, this, there's just, um, I don't know. It's just funny the way that diaspora comes, you, it lifts people up, it deposits them in different places. You still have this history that you have to contend with, this history that you have to unpack and that you have to have to sort out. And the amount of stress in your daily life and the weight of that history, you have to find some kind of balance in terms of, of, of working with that. And whether it's, um, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, there's just so many dimensions of this conversation that this, this really has, uh, it just opened up a lot of my mind. And I, um, I mean, like I've been thinking about this book a lot, which is, I don't know if people know it, they should know it. It's, it's, it's silencing the past power in the production of history. And it talks about, well, basically it's how the history of Haiti has been hidden over time. And that he, he showed how he can recover elements of it by going back to the local history and pulling these things together. And you get a different picture. And from that picture, that's where that hope for healing can come out. It's not gonna fix that past, but that past, you just can't shut the door on it either. Because I tell you, I got bodies falling out the closet every day with, with some of the work that I do. I think we all do. Mm -hmm. and, um, those are not, they're not easy uh, things to understand. Like something I'm trying to question is like violence. Is this violence that was perpetrated on me through, you know, my lived experience is, how does that relate then to the violence of this system? You know, where do we go with that? How do we heal from that? I mean, it's, it's, I mean, this is huge. This is huge, Nika. This is big. Mm -hmm. It's hurtful. You just have to sit in it too. Yeah. That sitting in it part is what gets me every day. Mm -hmm. forward. But then by, there's that hope though that you can help somebody else connect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of the work that I'm doing now has gone in terms yeah. of finding these lists of people. And I call them my ancestors too because they're part of that picture. They're part of that struggle. They're part of that. It may not be like, you know, that direct, direct line, but I don't care. They were there and they deserve to be mentioned. They deserve to be remembered. And nobody, nobody deserves to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's I, kind of what the system keeps going back to. Yeah. Bernice. I, you know, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, Ellen. I think that so many times people misinterpret the behaviors of, of black people. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at it as being aggressive, anger, hate. And, you know, we have to go through a healing process also mm -hmm. to understand the trauma uh, that has been perpetuated over a long period of time. It Too is long. cumulative. And so even when you go into your genealogy and you start seeing things, family members don't want to hear it. Oh, you know true. why? Mm -hmm. They don't want to hear it because it's almost re-traumatizing. It's almost better for them to just forget it. And one of the things that we have to learn is you, you, have, you should remember. Remember, honor, think of resilience, think of survival, because our ancestors did survive. They survived trauma. And every time you look at a new uh, event, it does re-traumatize you. It takes you back to some place. Mm -hmm. And we need to talk about that with each other so that we are not perceived as being the angry, aggressive person that nobody wants to be around because it's there. It, it is part of our reality. And mm -hmm. genealogy is continuing to bring that reality to the forefront. That's right. Julia? Unmute yourself, baby. Okay. Um, I just wanted to share um, the best definition that I have for historical trauma. Um, and I've adopted it myself. It's um, historical trauma is the collective emotional and psychological injury, both over the lifespan of an individual and across family generations as a result of a societal, ethnic, or racial trauma some examples are the Holocaust, Native American genocide, forced relocation, like Japanese concentration camps, and of course, 
African slavery. Um, I just wanted to clarify that just so everyone kind of knows what we're talking about uh, for those unfamiliar with historical trauma. And um, one of the ideas that I've been flirting with, I'm currently doing research for a journal article about transforming our local museums into cultural healing spaces. Um, like we have a day of remembrance, we have the Holocaust day of remembrance, but we don't have a annual day to remember our enslaved people, not just for our community, but I think it's something that needs to be done nationwide. I think that would increase empathy for our ancestors and our, and our community for people of color. And also, um, humanize our ancestors because too many people are so quick to say slave, slave, slave. And um, when I went to the African American Museum in Philadelphia when I was um, in high school, I learned we do not call our ancestors slaves. We call them enslaved people because slave is a piece of property. So every every state has museums, and I think that if we can create some sort of like collective ritual and grieving and telling these stories and speaking face to face with people in our communities and people outside of our communities that hopefully that will generate some healing. I will, can I, can we all volunteer that in 2019, we will co-sign with Julia on whatever the day of remembrance is, we'll help her with developing the name and uh, whatever that is. Cause I think, I think maybe folks have sort of stayed away from that because it's so big mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's so much trauma that's been inflicted. And here's the thing, it's not even, it's not the type of trauma where, oh, well, you know what? The, uh, the perpetrator's dead. Perpetrator ain't died. The perpetrator still lives in systems, laws, all that sort of thing. So that's a big reason why I think that maybe I'm sure somebody has had that idea, but they just never saw it through because it was too big, you know, but you have to remember, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? You know, Black History Month, they couldn't think of Black History Month. They thought of the week first, then it became a month, right? So it's just progressive and, and it takes time. Um, and, and what did you, uh, you want to chime in with something, Rosalind? Well, yeah, I just, I, I want to say like, you know, we started out with the question of why as I'm listening to, to all of you, why it is that you do this work and you don't necessarily like cognizantly look at like the emotional impact that it takes on. And I think it's because of what everyone has been saying here. And so like, as a psychologist, like I, like I, I feel myself like leaning in and I feel compelled. Um, <laughs> She froze. She froze. But you know what? We take <laughs> hugs any time of the day. People want to give them out. We do. We do. Yes, that's we the do. Thing. I don't want to. Yes. We I need don't to wanna... embrace each other. Yeah, yes. That's what I was going to say. That That's where I was sort of moving yeah. the conversation. Because yeah. we can yeah. stay on trauma forever. Oh, yeah, um, stay there. And, and we don't want to stay there. You know, whenever you are working in a group setting or you're working with people and you're dealing with a lot of emotional things, and this is, this is good feedback, I think, for everybody that's watching and listening, you never want to leave the people raw, right? right. right. Just as, as if you were playing baseball and you slid into third and you scraped your knee, you wouldn't just go home and take a shower. You wouldn't put a Band-Aid. You wouldn't put, you know, ointment or whatever it is on it. You know, um, you would treat it and you would you would deal with it and you would process it. And so when we're dealing with such emotional subject matter, we have to wrap. We've got to sell everybody back up. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and this makes me so sad because I'm like, where's she's got to come back in because um, we need because we need we need her and her expertise to talk about how we can be more emotionally intelligent when it comes to genealogy and family history research. Julia brought in, you know, um, she talked about something um, that's one of her practices that if it's information that is less than 100 years old, that it's not for public consumption. You know, that if it's after that, then it is for public consumption. I know that um, we joke in my family about having a unabridged family history that never gets published. <laughs> Those are just the things that the, the research team knows that, that there are parts of our database and certain facts that are locked down. They're not, they won't ever get out. That is not for public consumption. Those are things that, that people have communicated to us and that we're only documenting so that whoever gets the information later has that information and they don't go down that line trying to research it. What are some of the ways that you all have been 
um, more emotionally intelligent when it comes to your genealogy and family history with the things that you share, with how you convey things, you know, all that kind of stuff. Oh, I, 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 I was going to you on that one. Uh, okay, I'm after with, him. With, 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 sorry, with, with, with my family, uh, the level of incest, not not in my direct line per se, but when you when you have, and there's one in particular I'm thinking of that, that occurred where, long story short, the story that my mother told me ever since I was a kid, I went down south and told and repeated that story to um to, to one of my cousins down there, and she said, "What? That's what your mother said? Oh, there go that side." And then she told me the the the, the other version that turned out to be probably more true. <laughs> but that that division that occurred based upon you know uh, uh, incest within my within my family um, divided two two different wings of the of the same family because you know. One side didn't want to admit what happened. The other side, you know, did. Or the other side was like, hey, look, it happened. We're moving on. And But there was a child produced from that. You see what I'm saying? And so it, 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 was, very, it was very interesting um, kind of seeing that even on my own side. And I, and I don't think that my mother purposely misled me because she, she and I talked about it. But she had been misled, I think, by the generation before her about what had happened and whatnot. And so it kind of led to this. It was, like, it was like really awkward kind of thing because you know to me I'm like hey again you can be the detached scholar and just write stuff down but like you said this is something that happened within the past uh, 50 years past 50 or 60 years when this occurred you know that can have uh, implications for people now you know and how they are viewed or whatever you or, or what have you um, so so you know it's just about being responsible with sharing information I think. Yeah, I, w I was just going to say quickly, um, everything looks like it's moving forward and fine. Um, I want to make sure people realize that the best thing, again, I said it earlier, that could have possibly come out of the cemetery situation is that um, our extended family uh, is united still. Um, it looks like, based on the uh, court uh, teleconference we have, that everything... Uh, should be hopefully in the near future going our way so, and what i wanted um what i was demanding we got so hopefully. okay I'm, I'm trying to figure out how mm -hmm. this grows okay. into what we're what we're discussing mm -hmm. okay. in terms of the yeah um any any ways alex is I'll there um, there's a there's a there's a uh there's a really good question from the oh, chat room. okay i just wanted to say real quick with me personally you know, over the years since I've been doing it for the Ivories, even though I've been researching since 1998, I took over the family history for in 2003. Um, I usually go to my elders. I've surrounded myself with, because we're so large and we have 23 kids, I know who the elder is in each one of those branches. And I've developed a trust over time. Um, it's kind of like a gut instinct, what I know not to tell and you know, what they really want to know, because they don't always want to know the truth, but I do have it documented and I will answer, you know, whoever comes to me about it. But I usually go to the elder. I have James that I talk to, which is a cousin of mine and our president. So there's like a chain of command we kind of go through when, um, you know, it's sensitive information. Um, but what do you, but that's the thing. Sometimes the elders are, not the people that you consult because they have helped engineer the toxicity in your family. So we, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to reckon with that, right? Because yes. there's somebody, I mean, because James brought up the pedophilia. Let's just go ahead and put that out there because that, that is a real subject in people's families, right? People don't realize, they don't know how they've come to be they find out later it was rape it was it was a number of different set of circumstances it's still trauma it's still it's still on the level of things that we're talking about sometimes the elders want to keep that information hidden they don't want the person to know the truth the person has reached out to them has reached out to everybody they clearly are crying out for help that they want to know the truth and and there's this guard of folks who are protecting the accused you know, this, these are real things we're talking about, you all. And that's the thing. And, and a lot of times we're, we're talking about people being, uh, uh, you know, the product of rape through slavery. 
-hmm. I think all of us have a, a ancestor who had that situation take place. I don't think there's anybody on this panel who does not descend from somebody that where that takes place. But I, I'm just I just want to bring the question back home. How can we be more emotionally intelligent? when it comes to genealogy and family history and how we share the information. And Raj, you got cut off. We want to make sure we get you to finish your point yes. before, we, before we continue on with this question. Oh my God, I was panicking. Cause I'm like, oh my, my computer just stopped working. So I'm on my cell phone. I hope oh. you much interference. Um, but uh, so what I, what I wanted to say just was to kind of bring it all full circle that you know, as you're, you're doing the work, number one, as researchers, you're going to be inquisitive, right? And so that's what kind of propels you. Uh, and then, this, you know, this is your history. Um, and so it connects you to it. Um, but then also because truth is so important um, for yourself, if you're working with other families, you know, that compassion, we start to tap into that compassion. And so uh, we kind of talked about, you know, the, the impact of secondary traumatization, um, but there is a real thing called compassion fatigue, you know? Um, and so uh, as far as being more emotionally intelligent, the way that compassion fatigue kind of fits in there is that because there's nothing wrong with being compassionate, right? That's what drives us um, to do the good work that we do in this world. Um, but also when you, the weight of the information that you're constantly receiving becomes so heavy, um, it can start to become o overwhelming, um, it, it starts to bleed into your sleep, uh, the way you're in, engaging with your family, um, your, your interests, um, your, your mood. Um, and so the way that emotional intelligence plays into that is, number one, being self-aware. Uh, it all starts with being able to really recognize and modulate those, those moments where you have intense periods of emotion and not be judgmental. You know, because, you know, we come from, um, uh, you know, a history of disenfranchised people, abused people. Right. Uh, we've we've been accustomed to sucking it up and move on. Right. Um, but that is not that doesn't serve us well. You know, so um, as you do this work, being mindful of what you're feeling and allowing it to be not having a, what, what I call unconditional positive regard for whatever comes comes in and comes out, you know, um, and being present with those emotions, sharing those emotions with, you know, people that you feel safe with, uh, people that you can be vulnerable with. Um, and, and if, if, and I would even encourage having a group like a genealogy support group that you meet quarterly or, you know, so often, and you come together and you talk about different things that you found, someone else may have, or probably has, come across something and they found a way that works for them as far as getting through that information um, and, and trying to help yourself not to work in a, in a vacuum. Even if your family isn't necessarily as receptive, the best thing when it comes to um, secondary trauma is to get it out, process it. Don't hold it in. Okay. Even for myself having, you know, done PTSD treatment and then managed the PTSD team, I made a, a, a conscious effort to make sure I was always available to process those moments where I'm like, I'm triggered. I don't know. I don't even know why I'm triggered, you know, and that's okay. But having that space where you can let it be and, and, and work, work through that. Uh, I would also encourage you to, to have like a normal, not to wait until you get that information that's really heavy to where you start implementing things. It actually needs to be a part of your regular regimen of self-care like how and if and everybody's living lives and raising children and and or you know taking care of family and working and so what have you done to carve out that space that's just for you how are you taking care of yourself and being very mindful because you know genealogy even as, as i talked to Nick, like that is her work like that's her baby and that makes her great at it but a lot of times your interests also overlap and that is that doesn't always serve us well. So when you're doing, uh, you know, personal quiet time, don't let it be that book that you've been waiting to read. That's not good for you. It doesn't serve you well. What we're doing is subconsciously we're perpetuating what's already stirred up within us. So making it a part of your normal. And my mother, and, and you may get some pushback. My mom says, oh, Raj, you're traveling too much. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I got to have my trips. I, and, and I need to not take a trip to Milwaukee. That's not 
that's not a breakaway because I'm still entertaining people and doing things. I need to go to the water. I need to hear the waves. I need to walk. And, it, and as long as I'm out there by that water, I feel that burden lifted off of me, the weight lifted off of me. And it might, for me, is water. For you, it might be getting outside, getting some fresh air, sitting on the porch, watching the clouds move, whatever it is, but making sure you have that regular day-to-day thing built in. So we're doing preventative care too. Because you have all these things coming in. You're researching the, everything that's happening in your day-to-day life, what we see on the news. And it's, it's overwhelming. We're on serious sensory overload. And then we, how many times are we sitting with our phone and because there's like constant stuff coming in and we don't give ourselves time, space to process all of it. Well, there's a, there's a great question um, that was in the chat room um, that I think we need to discuss as a group. And it says, how does, how does a white researcher like myself serve the people of color I'm researching for without causing more trauma? I want to help find their ancestors without causing more pain. And, and off the top of my head, I think it's just to be mindful. Put yourself in the situation of the enslaved people that you're researching, you know, <laughs> And, and not liken them to dollar values or to not have having any amount of human emotion, feelings, um, any of that stuff. You know, yes, this may be work for a client. This may be volunteer work that you're doing, but these are still people's ancestors. And just like how I would not, you know, literally take your 15 years work of work and your on and top of report and it's unstapled and fling it like this. You would not do that to somebody else's ancestors. So compassion is very important. Um, Also, don't consider yourself an expert when you haven't spent the time talking to people of color, when you haven't when you haven't read enough, when you haven't been put into enough situations where you cannot effectively and and sincerely empathize. Sincere empathy translates. Manufactured empathy does not. So pull from whatever you have to pull from. Maybe it's it's you had a friend that lost a sibling to cancer when you were a child and and you had to be there for your friend. And or or maybe it maybe you are are you befriended a family that is here, you know, and they're considered illegal aliens and and their a family they've the family's been torn apart. And and you are trying to, you know, reconcile, you know, maybe you bring groceries to their house, whatever, whatever situation you have to you have to draw upon that sincere empathy is what's going to get you through. People will read you so quickly, especially people of color, because we know when you are not being sincere. We know that we can we can see it coming from a mile away. It's the so yeah, exactly. Just like our Lord, we, we subject ourselves to secondary trauma. The secondary trauma is also it's, it works too, right? It's not just a, it's not just it doesn't just fail. It also works. So, um, you know, so I, I, I just, I just that's my feedback for the person. Do you all, Shelly? Do you have something that you want to particularly share with the question that was asked, person? Uh, um, are you talking about the question Sam asked? Yeah, the question that Sam asked, and really this goes across the board. It's not even so much for clients. This could potentially be for, you know, maybe you have a DNA match that is a person of color and they descend from a a slave owning fam, you know, slave owning side of your family and you're reaching out to them, you know, for contact and you're unsure, you're uneasy, right? Because this, this is, that's the one thing I want people to remember about this, especially since we're talking about slavery a lot, is just as hard as it is for someone who is, who is, you know, European dominant and has slave owning ancestors to reach out to the descendants of their former slaves who are either formerly enslaved people or they are family to them. Just imagine being the descendant of both of those groups of people, right? Not just the slaveholder. But the enslaved, who could potentially be a family member as well. That's a battle that we're constantly fighting all the time. So just as much as you think that it's super hard for you to do it, just imagine being on the opposite side. So what what feedback do you have, Shelly, just to answer that question? Well, my feedback, and I put it in the chat, one of the things I think people need to be honest with themselves when they're about to share information. And how you deliver that information is part probably more powerful from my perspective than the content of the information because people, if they aren't stepping up 
in truth to share valuable information that was meaningful or whatever their the information is people will feel that read that and not trust that person i think if we're going to deliver information not just to clients not on the stage but within the family it's got to come out right and truthful and there's several comments about the compassion part of that you know <laughs> even with the dna coming out now and that trauma and you know dna for me it's a warning thing for everybody you know just like pa ain't pa you know type thing there's so many things going on that also is ca causing trauma but for that to answer that question i think he needs to share I think he needs to be open, but he also has to understand how he's delivering that information to them. I've seen it happen, not in a favorable way, and it actually makes people put up walls and, and not believe what he's talking about. Because for the folks that own slaves, they got the records. It's not all at the courthouse. Those records are at the house repository and we want to go forth truthfully with compassion and respect and keep it that way, but deal with your own family also. Something else that I just thought of, and this is totally seems like it's out of left field, but who has seen the movie ghost with Patrick Swayze? Oh, love has it. Has everybody seen that movie? Alex, have you seen that movie? Okay. I figured you might not have baby. You a millennial. I understand. That, yeah. I was about to say, but in the movie Ghost, mm -hmm. who remembers Whoopi Goldberg's character? Oh, yes. Right? She was a seminal part of the movie, and mm -hmm. she was kind of a shyster, and you were trying to figure out what was going on. But she was a medium. She could, she, that was her right. gift thing, right? Mm -hmm. She could, right. she could hear the voices of people who had passed on and, mm -hmm. and get messages through to other people. And as we were having this conversation tonight, that's how I now see our role. We are Oda Mae Brown. Right. We've yes. been given the tools as much as we may want to fight it. Right. We don't want to deal with it. We just want to mm -hmm. know this is not my job. This is a purpose. If you are watching mm -hmm. this show, this is a purpose. This is not just a hobby. You wouldn't mm -hmm. be here for emotional stuff tonight if this was a hobby. And this is yep. just something you just do. Right. This was not the episode that you would tune into if that's just what. you No, do. not at all. Right. But in but we so we think about the things that she did in the movie, right? If you haven't seen Ghost in a while, you maybe you need to rewatch it. Ooh. But she subjected herself and put herself in a different situations, people she didn't know, things that she think she wasn't familiar with, but she trusted her gut instinct and she and she went forward because she knew that that was what her role was. Mm -hmm. And and we that's what we need to that's what we need to really latch on to is this is not something you can just cast away and just say, mm -hmm. oh well too. Because as we mentioned earlier, there are people in your family, there are people that you know that are just waiting for you to make a particular comment, statement, share a particular document that is going to send them on a forward trajectory that, that they did not anticipate. Don't forget the ancestors are leading all of this in my mind. You know, you, you get information when you can handle it. You get the tips, you hear the whispers, and either you follow them or you don't. And, and to me, that could be all connected coming down the generations because you definitely meet people for a specific reason that come into your life. The research, when you find it, and it might have been something you've had and you just interpreted it differently or analyzed it and it gave you more information. And I just say, I, I'm on a ride. It's really a ride. This journey of research is a ride and it's addictive. And that's why we got to control ourselves on how we handle this. Coming back to what Roz was saying, you, we have to have that checkout time. We have Absolutely. to. And, and I, I, the, another thing is to, to answer the question of the um the, the, the person that, that asked it. Um, yeah. I think the main thing, it, and Nika, you touched on it before, but it's to talk to the people. And when you talk, you have to always make sure you're listening at least two or three times as much yeah. because you never know what you're, you know, who you're dealing with. Because, you know, you come off as though you know everything and you may not. I mean, I'm thinking about, um, you know, Nika, you mentioned um, Ghost. You know, I'm thinking about Sophia in The Color Purple. 
You know, she said, mm. all my life I had to fight. You know, how are you going to talk brothers. about, you know, about her life when she lived it? Or even um, another movie with Oprah where, um, what was it, the, uh, uh, the Henry Adelax Lacks uh, movie. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, you, you can, you, you may have all the documents, have all this and a third, and you still may not know every single detail or what have you. So the main thing I think is to oh, is to have a conversation and not talk at people. And that's, and that's what I, I know, especially with, with older, um, older black folks, they used to, they used to white people talking at them, not talking to them. And Correct. so that would be, the, and, and, the, that would be the thing I would say. And, yeah. and I want to jump in here because um, I, I want to clarify something that came up in the chat room. One thing that is critical of any researcher, black or white, and if you, this is my mantra and it will always be my mantra. In order to understand anyone's ancestors, you have to look at the local history of that particular area because that's going to inform if you want to find out more about your ancestors, a lot more information than looking at just a document here or there. You have to understand which local socioeconomic political events have informed what has happened to anyone's ancestors. Example, I was someone recently told me there were no Native Americans in this particular uh, 1761 in Fairfield County, Connecticut. Okay, my response was to send them, as epic as I am, Forgotten Patriots that listed all of the Native Americans who fought in the Revolutionary War. You know, you have to look at local events. You can't look at your ancestors in isolation or anyone's ancestors in isolation. And that goes across the board, no matter what color you are, no matter what research you are. I want to jump in after Teresa. Um, One of the things that I would have for a white researcher who's or has taken on black clients, I think that there's something important in acknowledging that you that there are plenty of other working black technologists, working black experts out there that can take this work on. So I need that to always be remembered and considered. And then also I want you to remember that there will be no accolades, there will be no awards, there will be no you as a white researcher sound like he froze we yeah, can't hear sound him like he froze we can't hear you alex i think you froze, he froze. I'm a- can you guys hear me yeah no, he's no. still yeah. moving but <laughs> whatever there's alex no sound deep to alex. whatever he's saying is deep to him we just i just gotta yes. yeah we're just nodding yep. um say yeah. say it again so i we, heard him so for we, a minute so we, I was going to say, it's, it's about time. We're, we're at, we're at an hour and a half in and we still haven't hit current events yet. Yeah. Um, love y'all, but God. y'all know how y'all are. And if I keep the East Coast people to 11, they go and Bernice been muting her video. So I already know what that means. Yep. I know y'all. Okay. Um, let's talk about ways we could practice self-care. Roz has, has sort of brought that up. Um, you know, and what are some resources we can use with dealing with tough issues? She talked about having your safe space. That means, you know, when it's time to read and you're quiet, you're not picking up, you know, Barracoon by Zora Neale Hurston <laughs> because it came out today and that just sounds like something you want to read, right? You know, that means you're reading something fun. You're not reading really tough subject matter. That means that, you know, if you're on you know, the computer or on the phone, you're, you're browsing for something that's not genealogy related. You're, you know, maybe, you know, it's the type of music people ask me like, what do I do? I sew. That's one of the ways that I stop from doing research all the time. Right. You know, uh, me and Angela Garden, we talk about tomatoes. In fact, me and Angela have talked more about tomatoes and sweet potatoes in the last two or three weeks than we have talked about genealogy. That's another thing. So what are, what are ways that you all have practiced self-care? And if you don't, you need to be sitting back and listening to the people who, who are talking. I think you need boundaries. You really do. You just have to know when to put things down and, and also think about even when you go to sleep at night, you know, what are you going to put in your mind before you put that, you put your head on the pillow. And I have a rule, like I just stop. I just stop at a certain time, not looking at things because I, I deal with a lot of heavy stuff. And it was just, it, I realized that it was just getting to me. Um, I make yeah. earrings. Uh, I play with my animals. I mean, I get out. I mean, it's just, I, and also laughter is like the biggest gift, you know, to be able to crack up, to be able to laugh, to have that moment away from all this. And, you know, it doesn't have to be all the time, but just to have that release is, is a relief, you know? Well, I have my girlfriends uh, and, and I just love them. And we, we hang out. 
And That's I great. think that, and they're not genealogists, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> not to mention my crazy sisters. <laughs> uh, my daughter. And the sisters, not as in real sisters, but the sisters I grew up with in the community. They're not genealogists either, but they love to hear about it. So that's the support I get. So, well, I have my real sisters and then my other sisters, and and I quilt, but I need to get back to quilting. And but John, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost to ready Teresa. to get my puppy. What? Thank you, thank you, Teresa, because people keep talking about people. What if the people ain't there? You mm -hmm. gotta have a backup piece of self care. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Remember, and I, and Dr. Dr. Newton said you got to practice <laughs> when you're not in trauma. Now, see, and, and, see, and, see what Nika knows see? that behind this thing here is my <laughs> other life. Behind this, she is my sewing, yeah. my student. I'm in my studio. So you got to, that's just, what I'm saying. So, and, and, but, I, and, I, and, and those of you who know me on Facebook, I lost my yeah. boo two years ago and I'm almost yeah. ready to, to get a new puppy. So, and I live a half a block away from the pot, so I will be going on my walk. So don't but, worry about me. Thing, Bernice's, I will say Bernice's friends, they travel. That's what they do. They go and kiki and ha ha and toast it up. <laughs> That's what her and her friends do. Rosalind, what were you going to say? Something I, I was going to, I would encourage, remember carving out time dedicated. And so, for example, I used to sew, I used to quilt. I, I need to get back to that. Ooh, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I did not it's, know this. It's, it's, okay, it's, sorry. It's going back to the well. Every We need to go back to the well to replenish. Every time you find that new piece of information, every time, it, it remember, we're constantly carving away at that compassion, fatigue. Mm -hmm. So we need to refill ourselves, you know, and, and we you're only as good, you know, what do they say? You're only as good to others as you are to yourself. Mm -hmm. Um. So 10 minutes a day, that's it. Carve it out, set a timer and be consistent. You know, what we plan, we prioritize. Mm -hmm. Awesome. It's Go so ahead, important. King's kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's so and, and even be, you know, like some, some, and if you have a really hard time with being still, you know, maybe practicing guided imagery, um, mm -hmm. breathing, relaxation. There are lots of different apps that will actually walk you through. There's a mm -hmm. wonderful app called Breathe, the number two, Relax. And they mm -hmm. actually give you a tutorial on how to breathe. They have all these different images on how to self-soothe. I would encourage you to have a buffer time around bedtime. One hour before bedtime, everything is shut off. You, it's like that boundary because remember, sleep is our only our body's only way to rejuvenate ourselves. And right. so, if you're re up reading or taking in too much stimulation from all the you know computers, tablets, phones, and then we go right to the bed, you're taking these things to bed with you. If you lay down and that mind is still going, get up. Yeah, speaking of it's got to be doctor, positive too. I, speak, absolutely, absolutely. Speak, speaking of which, doctor, I am going to probably sign off early tonight. I got, <laughs> I have a, a meeting tomorrow uh, that, for work, but so I'm going to go practice exactly what you said right now. <laughs> good I want to say, say goodnight good night to everybody. Good night. Let me go to this Facebook and see him on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. 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 I was about to say go go and check Auntie because you already know we're going to have oh, somebody. Yeah. On That's the, and then, the, I'm gonna go see if he's there. So, but I, I just wanna just to wrap everything up before we go um, into some viewer comments. Um, I think this is all great feedback. I think we all need to really take sure. to heart the conversation that we've had tonight. And and I and you know, and one of the things that I think a lot of the panelists we go back and rewatch episodes after they take place. I think we need to rewatch and hear what we all said again. And I will definitely suggest to the audience as well, rewatch what we're saying, rewatch what we're talking about, and really process and and um just digest everything we're saying. And, you know, as I mentioned, this is, this is, this is hard work. And I think sometimes we minimize how hard it is and how emotionally taxing it is. And, you know, your, all your work and all of your effort is not going unseen. Your, your, you know, you may not see the fruits of it right now, but eventually you will. You know, I, I think back to literally I, two people sitting on the screen that I can account for. You know, the fact that at one point our shared ancestor was was enslaved in northeastern Louisiana with his family and maybe he never thought he'd see freedom. 
but here are two of his children sitting right here. One of them is a psychologist. The other one was was chilling with Uncle Al last week. Walking oh, so in giftings, right? This was this was all preordained. Perhaps maybe when he when he was sitting back at that time period, he he thought about maybe the day where his his children and his descendants would would not have to suffer the same fate or the same experience. But it is it is our jobs to translate that story um, mm -hmm. and to make it real and tangible for the folks that that are in our circle and 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 they may not be your family. It may be somebody at your job. It may be. Um, and maybe somebody you come across in the grocery store, you know, one of the things that I really strive to do is I strive to provide a cultural and historical context to everything that's happening right now to people so that we don't have another situation like we had last week. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, let me go ahead and share viewer comments and then we're going to get to, um, we're going to get to current events. So if your comments for tonight, uh, I think it's Nawili Hill says, I don't think it's generational talking about, um, you know, the sharing of information and stuff like that. She said, I think uh, it is how you have learned to clean your emotional filter as you mature. That'll hmm. preach. How wow. you have learned to clean your emotional future, emotional filter as you mature. I do not mean mature as in age. Our fellow panelist, Angela Walton Raji says, and as researchers, we sit for hours and we deal with records from the period of enslavement. We are sedentary, yet as our pressure rises, our health is affected. I think this is Laddie Lau. I don't know if I'm reading mm -hmm. that right. Says, uh, yoga and meditation is important. I do it for myself and I share it with my community. We are, are walking around with all types of trauma. Agree, agree, agree. And some of you are probably like, what happened to Ask Mariah? We knew we were going to go over time. <laughs> so that's the reason why we did not have an Ask Mariah for tonight. Moving into current events. Yes, there is no way we can have this conversation and we cannot touch on this. I know you're tired of talking about it, but we can't ever be tired of talking about this. We can't. From Vox, entitled The uh, Ignorance of Kanye West. Um, he mentions, of course, that we, I would imagine that everybody watching this has heard the comment from last week. If not, look it up. Um, it's readily available. It's everywhere. Um, Kanye, of course, in response says, of course, I know that slaves did not get shackled and put on a boat by free will. He wrote on Twitter, my point is for us to have stayed in that position, even though the numbers were on our side, means that we were mentally enslaved. Now, here's the question that I have about this whole scenario, because we can sit here and argue until Jesus comes back, until Mary has another baby, until there's a manger, and until uh, you know somebody's not president anymore about how wrong it was to say that slavery is a choice. But in my opinion, especially after being prompted to watch the full interview by my husband, <laughs> is this a cautionary tale and a direct example? And I'm referring to Kanye West. Is this a cautionary tale and a direct example of a lack of griots, family historians, and genealogists in a family? No. Or, hold on, <laughs> or perhaps open and generous griots family historians and genealogists. I'm sorry. Did someone in his family not fulfill their purpose and now we all see this manifested in this uh, quote? I, I disagree with that. I think I, Megan, our, our, our buddy Megan had it right. He had a third or fourth grade uncle who, who chose to, born free, chose to fight for the uh, United States colored troops. Okay, so that, I don't, I don't buy that. I think his mother's rolling over in his grave, and he's acceptable. He, he is. There's something that is Kanye with that, but I don't think you can uh, even trace that back to any of his other ancestors. They're rolling over in their graves. I mean, the other thing, it's so. He's getting older. That's the other part. And his the, the popularity he has is diminishing. So, I mean, in some way, to me, it seemed perfect way to try to throw something out there like that to appeal to another base. Well, and to sell records. He, I mean, yeah. he, he released, come on, this is, he, you know, it's money, money, money. You know, um, yeah. as long as people buy his music, it doesn't matter who they are. And obviously, but, he's and attracting a totally with different, a, a different audience. How do you have, I, how do you come up with a song that's like what love yourself or like yourself? I totally disagree, which is my own opinion. Mm -hmm. 
I, I think he's just lost in his way. He's in a totally different environment where he's at with the wife, the family, and all these other influences because he was not raised that way. You, you know, not at all. And I think he's just a lost child out there and he might be screaming for something, but I think the biggest thing is he just doesn't think before he talks. And I think he made that mess up in his head and it came out and needs to take that chill pill and get himself together and get out of the environment that he's in because it's well, unreal to anything that he has known. Something that, and this is another reason why I would suggest, you don't have to watch the whole 42 minutes. Watch yeah. the first probably seven mm -hmm. because it will clue you in potentially as to why this statement came out. Mm -hmm. He mentioned in the interview that his mm -hmm. older daughter, North, went to school. Right. They were talking about Martin Luther King and that the teacher told her she was black. Mm -hmm. Now that, that yeah. doesn't sound out of the ordinary for, for us, right? Mm -hmm. But for him, that was it almost seemed like it was preposterous that the teacher would consider her black. Now, think about his comment from that lens. Also, weigh in the fact that he keeps bringing up free thought, right? You gotta be free. You know, I want, I want free thought people not to think all the same and, and X, Y, Z. And, and that's a, a term he consistently uses during the full interview, especially in reference to, you know, the president and his supporters. But my question is, and like I said, you've got to watch the full interview because I really sat, I rewound and I synthesized this because I was trying to give my honey the benefit of the doubt that I sat and watched the whole interview. He wasn't agreeing with him, but he was just saying watch the whole interview. But if you're using the word free thought in reference to the president and, you know, potentially some of his supporters, what price do you pay? What, what's the price for appearing to sanction racism and the marginalization of the population to preserve free thought? Because that's in essence what's being done. By saying that you, you know, whatever you're saying, that you want to preserve free thought, you want people to think freely, but in the process of people thinking freely or you want them to think freely, that marginalizes other people. What is that? What's the value of that? What's the price tag on that? I have no idea because I'd never sell my ancestors out. You can't, you can't, you, you can't even pay me any but amount of money. But we're, not, but we're not everybody, you all. No, well, well, there are millions, there are millions, <laughs> but that's the thing. There are millions of other people who, who look like us, who are just as ignorant about their family history, mm -hmm. which is why we cannot pass judgment on him. Mm -hmm. I think this is a big picture problem. You know, one, he's a celebrity. He has yeah. a lot of responsibility. And for him to say that, it, I think it does two things. It emboldens white supremacists, which we know who are on the rise with the Trump administration. They have their new token Negro. Oh, look, Kanye, he's one of us. He understands. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's wrong with you black people. Why can't you get it together? Mm -hmm. um, and then two, we have a younger generation where I see as an educator, funding for history and humanities has gone down. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong, I love science and technology, but we're in an, a knowledge economy and it's not just data, it's not just numbers, it's not just people were slaves. If you don't have the ability to think critically and to examine facts, so, I want him to think deeply, not just think freely. That's what we need to do. And he thinks just, you know, not um, anybody who attacks Trump because they're kindred spirits. They're both narcissists. They're both mm -hmm. in love with themselves. They have these model wives. Um, they're very big on image. So I, I'm not surprised that they fell in love with each other. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she makes it I'm sad. not. Like, I'm like not. We're, like we're but, gonna have the so right. <laughs> But you so have right. a responsibility as a public figure. Mm -hmm. If this isn't your specialty, if you want to make music, make music. But yeah. don't make these statements and not back it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, speaking of music and people who are using their pulpit appropriately, of course I have to draw attention <laughs> to our Bay Donald Glover, aka Childish Gambino, 
mm-hmm. who came out with <laughs> probably one of the most powerful pieces of video art I think I have seen in a very long time yeah. um, from NPR quote, we're really mm-hmm. kind of grappling with what our entertainers at that level do with the spotlight they have on them, what kind of message they are projecting out into the world. NPR uh, hip hop journalist, Rodney Carmichael says, I think with Donald Glover, he wants to be putting out the concerns of black folk, of folks who are voiceless in this world. And I think he wants to present it in a way where it's as challenging to his audience as it is to those outside on a mass scale. And um, I just have to issue a warning because this video is very graphic, Um, but it, but very powerful. powerful. Um, And it harkens back to, you know, everybody's going to have a different perspective when they watch it, right? You're going to pick up something differently. When I watched it, it reminded me of what we're talking about. The secondary trauma that we get continually that's one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to talk about it on the show tonight was because this video literally visually depicts the secondary trauma that we get and how yes. we don't unpack it yeah. and how we keep dancing and we keep smiling and we keep moving on from stage to stage to stage in this big gigantic room of our emotional mess or our emotional well-being and and we're not properly processing it. So um, if you have not seen it, head to YouTube. When I went and looked at it and it had just been released, it had over 4 million views because it is that. <laughs> yeah. It is that. It is. Yeah. Like over 30 today. Yeah, in a day. Um, you guys have you feedback on it. You just described bullying. What you just described was bullying. And it just keeps coming, keeps coming, and keeps coming. Yeah. And mm-hmm. eventually somebody, somebody um, explodes. Yeah, because the impact is just like the trauma. It's the same. You get the same type of impacts from bullying as you do, like we're talking about here, you know, um, the secondary trauma and things like that. It's a daily thing, just like we're talking about to us as researchers. You go to work, you can have this experience as well. And there's, there's so many different levels. There's the, when I saw the video, it's the individual level, but then you look at the larger American, the point he's making is violence is as American as apple pie, right? Yep. Here we are. He's dancing around all these different dances, which in themselves tell a story. Mm-hmm. And you just look at the violence. It, it, it's so, it's so ordinary that, you know, you and and then the focus is on how we protect that mm-hmm. gun more than we protect the children who are being slaughtered in reference to the Charleston Nine or or the suicides that are happening and and dancing just goes on and and yeah. and, and, and there is a focus on guns that uh, is privileged and for and look a reason at all these people exactly. Or, um, but it's so funny because when people first see the 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 video, um, you know they react to it. What is this? He's dancing around, cooning around, without looking at the deeper references yeah, I was, in the I meeting. Would say, yeah, I would say don't watch him. Watch the background, mm-hmm. and that's why the you would probably have to watch it a couple times because your initial reaction is to watch him because. <laughs> As Kev on stage said, he's a grown man wearing slacks and he does not have on a belt. <laughs> and that in itself and it is doesn't fall down. Yeah. Like, and his pants don't come down. <laughs> but then again, but and people that, have referenced those pants were very similar to, to the pants that the Confederate mm-hmm. soldiers wore. Mm-hmm. You know, some of his poses are to the original, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh what is it, Jim Crow, or, or uh, you know, you sit there and and you're looking at it and you're like, wow, that's deep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Rosalind, what were you going to say before we move on to the last current event? Oh, I was saying the same thing she was saying. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what she said. <laughs> what she said. What she said. Oh, go ahead. Look at look at look at uh, look at Ellen getting Memphis vernacular. Go ahead, girl. <laughs> but do you think there was a point in there at one point where they were like, you know, people want to be black too. It's time to be black in a sense. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with the I just kind of got that feeling that everybody's taking all these things and looking at us from a gaze, but they're not really. They just want us when they need us. 
But the, the, the end of the I'm video is smelling that way, I think. I think the, the end of the video just blows it up. But that, yeah. that face that he has with those eyes that just look like he's, you know. Yeah. Well, well, here's the thing. Once you watch it, if you haven't seen it, make sure you comment, tweet, whatever us, because we people in the chat room are like, I didn't see all that. <laughs> it's like, yeah, watch it. Again. Watch it a couple times without paying attention times. to him and watch the background. And yeah. And well. something else I would say that also helps with music videos, turn the sound off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just mute your computer, keep the video running, but just watch without sound, and you'll probably pick up things um, differently than uh, than you would if you were watching. Okay, last current event, and there's no way we can go to today and not talk about this. Jesus loves us so much. <laughs> God, Allah, everybody loves us so much that <laughs> we would get blessed with a Zora Neale Hurston book in 2018. My, 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 finger snap, finger snap, badu, badu, badu. <sighs> what can we say about this book? Oh my gosh, we have talked about the Clotilda um, in Mobile for the longest time, Africa Town for the longest time. One of our panelists, Angela um, Walton Raji, uh, wrote an amazing blog piece about uh, Kudjo Lewis and his experience. Um, and now we've got first hand account interviews. I'm talking sitting and eating oranges and watermelon with Mr. Lewis. This is the, yes, I got my copy. I started reading it earlier. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. I, I Just getting through Alice Walker's intro, I highlighted about four passages and it was only a page and a half. I started. Uh, I had to share that. Yes. I had it to is, sit with that for a minute. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, it was just. Oh, it was so. It's just so good. Just the first few pages, you all. Oh my gosh, I haven't even really dug in deep, but it's the story of the last slave ship that actually made it to um, the United States. Last documented one. It was crashed off of. Uh, you know, the coast of Mobile, Alabama. This was 1860. The importation of slaves had been banned since 1808. So it's, you know, I don't know how many hundreds, you know, just years it had passed rather, uh, you know, when slave, the importation of slaves from Africa was banned. And for me, it especially touched me because the area that they talked about, the Dahomey Kingdom, Wida and Benin, I was just there a month ago. So when I'm reading through it, I'm seeing them I'm seeing him walking down the path. I'm thinking about the barracoon that he was in, like the where the pins were, where they buried all the bodies. Please, 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 if you don't purchase another book and it's only twelve dollars on Kindle, mm -hmm. you know, or if you're like me, some people like the paper books. I do both. Head to your nearest, um, you know, a bookseller and get a copy of this book because it is. Like I said, from just a few pages, I already know. And it's only 208, so it's not that big. But um, I think personally, just from what I've read so far, I feel like we almost need a special show just to talk about this book. Because it is really, I would say, out of sight of maybe a slave narrative, you know, where somebody has penned it themselves. But this is Zora, y'all. This isn't just, you know, just some random, right? This is Zora. I don't know. Y'all gonna have to let me know. But I think and I and I it. would I would also <laughs> suggest if you have time to try reading it aloud and mm -hmm. because that's a totally different experience mm -hmm. um, because one of the things Zora was a classically trained anthropologist and I have to give uh, props to her but she tried to record his voice as he spoke and so try reading it aloud um, and, and have that experience. Wow, um, wow. Well, that's the thing. So if you've got ties to Benin, um, hit me up. I, I will I will share my experience going to Benin last month um, and how awesome that was, even though I have no Benin Togo at all in any of my stuff. Um, but I've got pictures and I've got experiences. In fact, I have a friend that I worked on a photo project and I really felt like I was there in addition to work stuff was there to help her with her project, having like a firsthand experience, so. Um, and, and, one, and one last thing I wanna say is, um, it's very important that we realize maybe Zora, is, Zora was always ahead of our time. So maybe this the fact that this book has come out means that, you know, she has an audience. The, the, we are there to receive 
her knowledge. She's, I look at this book like it's no different from this book, no different from this book, no different from this book. No different from <laughs> this book. Teresa, the, Teresa the, clearly has a bookshelf next to her desk. Oh, or, or <laughs> lest we not forget for for my for my Boricua people, or this book, or this book. Sometimes yeah. there's a season in which mm. knowledge needs to be received. So this might be the way it should have already been. That here you have a consummate truth teller, and she's telling his truth. Mm. Mm -hmm. And in and, and Sylvia and Dioff's book is is just a, 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 a background for that. It, yeah, it's no substitute it's for it, it, it's no, you have to read both. I suggest both because it, it, it he's speaking and we have to hear his voice. And that's so important. If I say one thing, when we dig deep, we're digging to hear our ancestors voice. And here we have this gift. So. Mm -hmm. Do like I that. do. You, I ain't yeah. messing up my paper copy because I got it early. I got my finger <laughs> that I'll be marking up. <laughs> well, I will just say this this harkens back to Oda Mae Brown. Yes. Yeah, homework from this week, rewatch Ghost and, and pay attention to her character. No, I'm serious. Pay yes, attention to her character. Really effectively her. look at her from the perspective, just imagine she's not a, you know, she's not just a, a, a medium. She is a genealogist. Literally, she is. And and put yourself in that role, and perhaps maybe maybe you'll you'll look um, at things um, a little bit differently when it comes to historical trauma. Uh, you know, just what you share, all that. All right, moving back into announcements really quick. Know where something took place. Uh, knowing where something took place is crucial to family history research. In our next episode, we'll cover how you can use and create maps and how they can give a huge boost to your research efforts. Join us for Been Around the World, Mapping Your Family History next Tuesday, May 15th, 6 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. One of the most important parts of this has to do with knowing your family stories. We are uh, we are the stories we tell ourselves. And if we don't know our family stories, it's in its own way, a little like having Alzheimer's disease. Missy Purdue will provide tips, techniques, and checklists to help families thrive. Tune into How to Keep Your Family Connected, featuring Missy Purdue on Research at the National Archives and Beyond, hosted by Black Progen Life panelist Bernice Bennett, airing this Thursday, May 10th at 6 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. Also, don't forget to check out the African Roots podcast hosted by Black Pro Gen Life panelist Angela Walton Raji. We want to hear from you. This has been a two hour episode, so we already know you guys got a lot to say. There, maybe there was something we didn't touch on. Maybe there was something you thought was awesome. Be sure to weigh in on Twitter. T uh, tweet us at Black Pro Gen. Use the hashtag Black Pro Gen. Also, what's awesome about this newly evolved YouTube platform is that the chat is preserved. So as the show plays plays when people even go back for the replay the messages will display for them so continue uh chatting um in the chat box right now and if you're watching on the replay you can see those messages as well and before we say thank you i want to come back on screen and say thank you so much to our esteemed guest panelists julia joy and rosalind dr rosalind newton thank you so much for joining us and helping us guide this conversation um and with that I'm going to go ahead and pass it on over to my girl, True Lewis. Thank you, Nika. <laughs> that was another great episode. And I want to say thank you and much appreciation to our viewers. And a special thank you to each of the panelists. You all did so well. And Dr. Rosalind Newton and Julia, the Hill, the Hill historian, for joining us tonight. So keep the conversation going over at YouTube in the comment section. Hit us up on Twitter and we'll see you on the 15th, mapping your history. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Black Pro Gen Live. Black Pro Gen Live. Black Pro Gen Live. Hello, everybody out there. Black, Black Pro Gen Live. Black, Black Pro Gen Live. Too much. The unapologetic Black and people of color viewpoint the place where evidence tells the stories. It's time for fun, learning,